There's a word that the Apostle Peter says. It's the last verse of his second letter. Second uh, Peter 3 and verse 17. You, therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, and he's referring in verse 16 to those who distort the scriptures, speaking of things which they are, verse 16, something's hard to understand and they distort the scriptures. He's referring especially to some things that Paul wrote, verse 15. As our beloved brother Paul has written according to the wisdom, he's writing, thinking of Paul's epistles and how even in those days there were people who were distorting what Paul had written. I think he's particularly referring to justification by faith, which is distorted even today, where people assume that I'm clothed to the righteousness of Christ, so I'm okay, it doesn't matter. I can live as I like uh, because. God doesn't see me. He sees me clothed in the righteousness of Christ and underneath that clothing, I can live as I like and do what I like because once saved, I'm always saved. Yeah, he says there are many things that written there which are hard to understand. One second Peter 3.16, which the untaught, untaught by the Holy Spirit, and unstable, distort, as they do the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction. There's a lot of teaching today on justification by faith and once saved, always saved, which I believe send, has sent more people to hell than probably any other doctrine. Now, I, I firmly believe in justification by faith. There'll never be a time in our earthly life, the best of us, that be able to stand before God, even with however much we have grown in sanctification. The greatest saint on earth, the Apostle Paul himself, could not stand before God without being clothed to the righteousness of his Christ at the end of his life. So I firmly believe in justification, and being clothed to the righteousness of Christ, but it never becomes an excuse to live as I like. It never becomes an excuse to not press on to perfection. It never becomes an excuse to say that, well, then it doesn't matter how I live, it does people who turn the grace of God into licentiousness. Therefore, beloved, verse 17, knowing this beforehand, I mean, we've got now 2,000 years of church history to show the corruption that has come from all the distortion and twisting of scripture. And I know when we preach this, when I preach this for so many years, I've preached it for 40 years now, people have accused me as though I don't believe in justification by faith. We believe in it very much. But I don't believe in being imbalanced, just like I don't believe in being imbalanced the other way, where we, where we don't believe in eternal security. I believe there's eternal security for all who follow Jesus. That's what he said. My sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I give them eternal life. John 10, 27, 28. But be on your guard, lest you be carried away by the error of unprincipled men and you fall from your own steadfastness. So how shall we protect ourselves from being carried away by the error of unprincipled men? It's not that they are not intelligent. Their error comes because they lack principles in their life. They don't live by the principles by which Jesus lived. That's why they go astray. And that's why simple, unlearned men like Peter don't go astray. And great scholars today who get doctorates in Bible schools go astray because there's a lack of principle in their life. And you also, if you are not, uh, if you don't watch in this area, you can fall from your own steadfastness. And so the only way to avoid falling is to grow. But, verse 18, grow 
in grace, in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I see this as the only way to avoid backsliding. That we must have a determination in our life that no matter how much we have progressed, and that can be at different levels for all of us, like children in kindergarten or first grade or second grade or 10th grade or those in college and first, second, third year in college or those who are doing PhDs. Everyone is at a different stage in the Christian life. The whole Christian life is an education. Wherever you are, you must be growing. The only time we can stop growing is when we say, oh, I've become completely like Christ now. No one is there. That'll happen only when Christ returns. But from the time we are born again till that day when Christ returns, there must be continuous, steady growth. It doesn't happen overnight. I mean, our children don't suddenly grow up to be adults. They don't shoot up in height. And we don't have to keep examining ourselves. You don't keep measuring your child's height every day and get nervous that he's not growing. No, they, they'll grow. But we are concerned if he's not growing. We need to be concerned if we are not growing. And grace, grace is not something we just receive at the beginning of our life. It says here we have to grow in it. Knowledge of Jesus. John 17, 3 says that um, eternal life is to know Jesus. There must be a growing in the knowledge of the Lord. It's like, when you first get married, your wife does not really know your mind. Even though she may love you a lot, she may love you wholeheartedly, but she doesn't know your way of thinking. But if you have lived together in love as good partners, over the years she comes to know you more and more. So that if one day somebody comes to your home and says, what is your, what will your husband think about this particular thing? You could give an answer immediately. He says, I know how, what he would decide in this situation. That is how we are to know the Lord. We may love him fervently the day we are born again. Like a wife may love her husband wholeheartedly, and yet she doesn't know him. But as time goes on, if they live together in peace and love, she comes to know him better and better and better and better. That... Uh, she, can, she knows his mind. And it's a wonderful thing to know the mind of the Lord. And it, it begins, of course, by reading the scriptures. But it increases as time goes on. And the Holy Spirit, if he sees that you're faithful in seeking to go the way that Jesus walked, he will enable you to know him more and more and more and more. And that is how we know his will in different situations which are not written in scripture. In the beginning, the only areas where we know God's will is where it's clearly written. This is, I can't do this or I can't do that. That's like the early stage, the first grade. But as we grow in the Christian life, we should be able to sense in our spirit what the Lord would do in this situation, what the Lord wants me to do in a particular situation where there's no particular answer in the Bible. It's a wonderful thing to be able to come to that place because you come to know the mind of your divine husband by living with him and living with him and listening to him, seeking to be like him. You become more and more and more. And it's a wonderful thing. You can start that from very early in your Christian life. As soon as you're born again, you say, I want to know him more and more and more. It's a, one of the greatest tragedies I see in Christendom is people who have been believers for so many years, they don't seem to know the Lord any better than they knew him when they were first converted. Paul says to the Corinthians, he says, you guys are still drinking milk. Imagine if you have a child, five, ten years old, and can't eat any solid food. You'd really be concerned. That's a concern Paul had for the Corinthians. You've been believers so long. You're still drinking milk. You can't eat any solid food. It means you're not growing up. You can't go into the deeper things of God's word. You're really interested in just the minimum of how my sins can be forgiven and how I can go to heaven. That's milk. If I talk to you some of the deeper things, 
You don't seem to have a year for that. So growing in the knowledge of Jesus and growing in grace, let me turn you to John chapter 1 where it speaks about how grace came through Jesus Christ. John 1, it says, the glory of God, verse 14, 114, John 114 was seen when the word became flesh and dwelt in us, the glory as of the Father, full of grace. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, Jesus was full of grace and truth. And that grace, we read in verse 17, came through Jesus Christ. Moses could never bring it. Moses could only bring the law. That's the clearest verse that teaches us that there was no grace in the old covenant. It was only law. Grace came only through Jesus Christ. But from that fullness, which is described in verse 14 of grace and truth, we read verse 16, from his fullness we receive grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. It's endless. Because his fullness is so endless that we are to receive from his fullness of grace Grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace, which means that every year I must be a little more Christ-like than I was last year because I've received more grace from God, a little humbler, a little purer, a little more loving, a little more controlled in my speech, even though I may not be perfect. Grace upon grace, it's like a child going from second grade to third grade to fourth grade to fifth grade, steadily growing up. He hasn't got his PhD yet. He's a long way from that, but he's growing. What a wonderful thing it is if you have a church where every person is growing in grace and not just in knowledge of the Bible, in the knowledge of Jesus, which is very different from knowledge of the Bible. There are many people who know the Bible who live in sin. Pharisees were classic examples of that. And we have lots of people in, in the world today, lots of pastors in the Bay Area and everywhere who have a lot of sin in their lives, but they know the Bible. You can't live in sin if you know Jesus. There's a world of difference. So grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Make that a goal in your life, my brothers and sisters, that you don't get satisfied with just a certain amount of grace. It's like a child, you know, oh, I've come to second grade, I can read and write now. How many of you would say, okay, you can drop out of school? My girl, my boy, you don't, you don't have to study anymore. You can read and write, that's enough. We're concerned that they grow their understanding to be able to live in this world. It's exactly how God is concerned. John speaks in 1 John and chapter 2, first let epistle of John, chapter 2 and verse 12 to 14. He speaks about three stages in this growth. He says, first of all, we are little children. I'm writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. That's where we all begin as little babies. The first thing. Our sins are forgiven. You must be sure about that, otherwise you can't even progress beyond that. He, for each of them, he repeats it twice. And uh, the other thing little children should know, right from the time they are children, verse 13, last part, is I've written to you children because you know the Father. To know God as your Father, something you must know right at the beginning of your Christian life. To know that your sins are forgiven, verse 12, for his name's sake, is something you must know right at the beginning of your Christian life. Remember, these are the two things you must know. Your little children, you must know for absolutely certain that every filthy, wretched sin you committed in your past life has all been blotted out in the blood of Jesus. And God says, I will not remember it anymore. Your times of ignorance, God says, I'll overlook. I don't even look at it. I, I mean... Other human beings who don't know God may remember your past and remind you of your past. Not God. If you have turned away from sins that you've committed and repented and confessed of sins you committed even yesterday, God says, I will not remember you, your sins anymore. 
And that's where we see the evil of some husbands and wives who when they get upset with each other, they remind each other of the mistakes they committed in the past. To taunt one another. You did this one year ago. You did this 10 years ago. You did this 35 years ago. It's amazing how the devil reminds your memory. There are a lot of other things we want to remember, we can't remember, but things which we're not supposed to remember, the devil is very quick to remind us. It must end, brothers and sisters. It must end. Not even husbands and wives, even to other believers. You know, some things which are somebody slipped up in and messed up their life in the past, forget it. God says, I will not remember. Why in the world do you want to remember it? it hasn't, can't we treat other people with the kindness with which God has treated us? I want to be kind to other people and merciful. And I tell you, it can be a pretty selfish reason <laughs> because it says if you're merciful to others, in the day of judgment, God will be merciful to you. So even if you're a selfish person, <laughs> you better be merciful to others. I mean, that's not the best reason to be merciful, but it's the second best reason. <laughs> be merciful because in the day of judgment, it says in James 2.13 that God will be merciful to you in the day of judgment. It's a great verse, James 2.13, that if I'm merciless to other people, my judgment will be merciless in the day of judgment. Now, a lot of people don't believe that. I believe every word of Scripture. I've read this book 50 years and the more I've read it, I'm absolutely convinced this is the word of God. I feel sorry that we have a generation growing up that knows more about television than God's word. And that's why I'm scared about the next generation of Christianity, what it's going to be like. I did a series of studies of 70 hours through the Bible, <clears throat> which is on our website, freely for anybody to listen to. And the reason I did it about 14 years ago was because I wanted to pass on a legacy to the next generation of what the scripture is all about. To teach them that every book in the Bible is interesting and every book in the Bible has got a message for us today. And you must read the whole Bible, not neglect any part of it. I would encourage you all to listen to it, to get at least to get an overall knowledge of the scripture. And that's the reason also why I did a verse by verse study through the entire New Testament, which is also freely available on our website. Because, you know, if we don't know the scriptures, we don't know God. I believe God's word is true, that judgment will be merciless, James 2.13, to one who has not shown mercy to others. It means if you're hard on somebody, because the guy slipped up in some way, I wouldn't, like, I, wouldn't be like, uh, I wouldn't like to stand anywhere near you on the day of judgment. It's going to be pretty bad, I'll tell you that. Be merciful. Just as God has been merciful to you, he said, Jesus taught us to pray, forgive, forgive us our sins exactly like we have forgiven others. You know, we say, say these things so lightly. And I know in my younger days, in my foolish younger days, when I was also never took these things seriously, because I never had a spiritual father to drill these things into my head. I wish I had, but I didn't have one. To tell me, hey, forgive others, man. Forget it. Don't keep these things in your mind. If they come to your mind, reject them. Anyway, I thank God I learned it before it was too late. But you folks have the opportunity to learn it from a very young stage in your Christian life. Determine in your life that you will not remember the sins of others against them. If you're an elder in a church and you're thinking of giving responsibility to people, you certainly need to assess people and need to know about something, and that I agree, but don't hold people's sins against them. Be very careful. You children have been, you must know that you've been forgiven. And you must know God is your father. In the elementary, I mean, knowing the father is another matter in which we know him more and more and more. I'll come to that in a moment. But to know him as a father is the privilege of a child from day one. A child, a little baby, can look up to his father and soon is able to say a few words, Papa, Dada. And the 
joy with which a father picks up his child. We have to recognize that God looks at us like that. God doesn't uh, wait for you to become mature because before he delights in you. If you want to have a mental picture of how God looks at you as a little newborn, born-again child, uh, look at the smile on a father's or a mother's face when they pick up their newborn baby. Newborn, you know, it's this, the parents know this child's going to cause me a lot of problems, especially in the next one year, uh, and probably more later on, <laughs> of other, ty other types of problems. <laughs> but it doesn't make a difference. It's such a look of delight. I picture that sometimes in my mind, how the way of, glow in a mother's face, in a father's face to see a child and say, Lord, my dad in heaven, you look at me like that. I want to believe that. I know I've caused you a lot of problems and probably will cause you a lot, so, some more, hopefully less in the days to come. But you still look at me with great delight. It is essential. This is a foundation for the Christian life. It's not something that makes us exploit God's goodness, no. It makes us delight in Him that I never want to hurt Him. Like, you know, this phrase, the fear of God. There are two types of fear of God. One is the fear that God will hurt me. And the other is the fear that I might hurt God. That's the type of fear we need to have. I might hurt you, Lord, by by my conduct, by something I do today or say to someone, I never want to hurt you. So in that way, you can know God as your father from day one. Then John speaks about the next stage in the Christian life, which is uh, young men. And for young men, he says in 1 John 2.13, you have, in the middle of verse 13, you have overcome the evil one. That's the stage we should come to. Where I know that Satan was defeated on the cross. If the first step in the Christian life is to know my sins are forgiven and God is my father, then the next step in the Christian life is to know that Satan was defeated on the cross. He's got no power over me. He cannot touch me. I can resist him and he will flee from me. You're free from the youngest believer. You have overcome the evil one. You know, so there's no such thing as, you know, the Bible says about, I know, in Ephesians 6, about we don't wrestle with um, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and principalities. But you shouldn't think of struggle like, some giant coming and the devil is like some giant coming and struggling with me and I'm struggling, struggling, struggling to knock him down. No. That's not how I understand it. I, I don't struggle with the devil like that at all. In the days when I was ignorant, probably, yes. But now, now I, he was defeated on the cross. He's alive, but he, he's got no weapons. It's, it's, it's Colossians 2. Verse 14 and 15 says, his armor has been taken away from him. He can't harm me. And that's what he fools believers about. He, he, makes, he scares people. Do you know the number of believers I've met in my life who are scared of the devil? Who are scared the devil may do this to them, do that to them, do, do, do the other thing to them? I remember one pastor in India telling me that his, his neighbor did some witchcraft on him and he was lying down in bed, sort of paralyzed for many weeks. I said, where was Jesus all that time when your neighbor was doing witchcraft? He wasn't around. You call yourself a Christian or you're probably not even born again then. And then I agree the devil can do a lot of witchcraft. I've seen people in India who are harmed by witchcraft. They can't touch a child of God who believes that Satan was defeated on the cross. That's why when I lead a person to Christ, the day they accept Christ, and I say, now you've got to receive Jesus, so the person's being born again for the first time. One of the first things I ask them to say, to speak to the devil, say, Satan, I don't belong to you anymore. I say, now you've asked Jesus to come into your heart, now you speak to the devil. He can hear you just as much as Jesus can hear you. 
tell the devil, I don't belong to you anymore. You were defeated on the cross. You got no power over me. And every contact I had with you in my past life, knowingly or unknowingly, I renounce in the name of Jesus Christ right now. Because a lot of people have been fooling around with the devil or with, you know, things to do with black magic and all types of stuff, reading what the stars foretell in the newspaper and getting their palm read and all types of things that people do and many other tarot cards and Ouija boards and all types of things that people do, renounce them, and sometimes unknowingly. Parents have taken their little children to temples and places like that. So I say you must renounce in Jesus' name everything that... So right from the very day one, I seek to help them to know that the one who lives in you now is greater than the one who's in the world. You don't have to be afraid of him. I mean, you yourself are not as strong as him, but you've got somebody living with you. you. You're scared of all these fierce pit bull dogs coming at you in the past, but now you've got this lion coming along with you wherever you go, and those pit bulls are running with their tails between their legs when you come along because you've got this lion with you now. That's a little picture. Yeah, without that lion, I'm scared. These pit bulls can tear me to pieces. Demons and the devil like that, but I have a lion with me. And anytime these bulls come, I just got to say, just give a roar and they all run away. In the name of Jesus, the weakest believer can resist the devil and he will flee. So you young men, you have overcome the evil one. And it's repeated again in verse 14, 1 John 2, 14, the last part. You young men, you're strong. The word of God abides in you and you've overcome the evil one. That's the, that's the secret. You'll never overcome the evil one if the word of God doesn't abide. Abide means has a permanent home. Not like a visitor. Abide means a permanent home. The Bible has got a permanent address in my heart. The Bible has got a permanent address in our heart. Then I'm strong. As I said, we are living in a generation that's growing up that's pretty ignorant of the Bible. And I hope none of you will be like that. I hope all of you will determine to raise the average of Bible knowledge in the world by your devotion to study the scriptures. Yes. Say, Lord, I'm going to raise the average by my devotion to study the scriptures. If you are determined to do it, you can do it. Please take time to study the scriptures. You get to know the word. And if you find some passages you can't understand, you can go into the internet. And I said, we have a lot of resources in our own CFC website where you can read and listen, but you will not be able to overcome Satan in your life if you don't know the word of God. You think you're better than Jesus Christ. And Satan came to him. How did he struggle with them? There was no struggle. Satan came with temptation number one. Jesus said, it is written. That's it. End of matter. Temptation over. And so the devil says, aha, so you're going to say it is written. Well, it is written that he will give his angels charge over you to keep you in all his ways. So why don't you jump from the temple? Jesus said, it is also written, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So remember, that the devil can tempt you with scripture. That's what we learned from that second temptation. And if you don't know what to say to the devil, it is also written, you'll be deceived. You know, I, as you probably know if you heard me, that I speak a lot against all these false preachers and money-loving preachers and false miracles and all this type of stuff and then all the counterfeits of the Holy Spirit and people come to me and say, Brother Zach, be careful, it is written if you blaspheme against the Holy Spirit, you'll never be forgiven. Be careful, that may be of the Holy Spirit. I say it is also written in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. I say, I'm not scared. Some people are scared. 
because they know only one verse. When the devil quotes that one verse to them, they keep quiet. You're not going to get me keep quiet because I know what is also written. The whole truth is not, con the, Bible, the whole of Bible truth is not contained in it is written. The whole truth is contained in it is written and it is also written. So we must know the scriptures. That's how we overcome Satan. That's how Jesus overcame Satan. And the third temptation, he comes again and Jesus says it is written. All the three temptations mentioned, we don't know, Jesus was tempted in millions of ways during 33 and a half years. Three of them are mentioned to us. And it's interesting to see that all three he overcame by quoting God's word. So I presume that every other temptation that came in his life, there was a word to counter it. When he was tempted to be anxious, or we tempted to be anxious, or any temptation, there is a word in scripture to counter it. <clears throat> to drive away fear. So the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. The, and there's certain people, it's almost as though the devil gives up on certain people and says, no, you're trying with that fellow. He's always going to quote scripture to me. It says about Jesus that the devil departed for a season because he'd come back a little later, but he knew he had no, he'd get no headway with Jesus. And it's a wonderful thing, my brothers and sisters, if the devil sees that he's not going to make much headway with you because you're standing on the ground of scripture. There may be many doctrines in scripture you can't understand or explain, but that's, that's not important. The important thing is to know what scripture says about sin. That's the primary reason why Jesus came. Like I remember um, a mother gave a Bible to her son and wrote on the front page of it, a little boy, as he was going away to college or something, he said, either this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. Absolutely true. Either this book will keep you from sin or sin will keep you from this book. And if you ask yourself, what is keeping you from this book? It is something which you don't call sin, but which is sin. <laughs> Some type of time spent in things which hinder you from another word, from reading God's word. In other words, reading God's word is not a priority for you. We never forget to eat. We never forget to sleep. We can forget scripture because it's not a priority. And I would say there's something lacking in our experience of salvation. It's like a baby that doesn't cry for milk, something fundamentally wrong with that child. The doctors would say there's some sickness there. You don't have to teach a child to cry for milk. It's spontaneous. I mean, you don't have to be reminded, hey, it's time to eat food. Your stomach reminds you there's a hunger, there's something built in. It's when you're sick. People who have cancer in their stomach, they don't feel hungry. That's not a blessing. So there is a, if you're really born again, you're walking with the Lord, there'll automatically be a hunger to know God's word. You don't have to be reminded, come on, read the Bible, read the Bible. That's like forcing a cancer, person with cancer, come on, you've got to eat something, man. You haven't eaten for so many days, eat something. There's, there's something sick about a believer like that. Normal, healthy believer will have hunger for God's word exactly like a healthy child has a hunger for food. You don't have to educate it. So make sure that your relationship with the Lord is clear how to be a healthy person. I'll tell you, get rid of every sin your conscience is bothering you about. I'm not talking about victory. I'm talking about confessing whatever is known sin. You've done something wrong. Forgive everybody. And don't keep reminding yourself of the evil other people did to you. Forgive them. Release them. You know, Jesus said about that man who hadn't forgiven somebody and he went out, uh, uh, he caught that fellow by his throat, even though the king had forgiven him millions of dollars. 
And that picture of his going and catching his fellow slave by the throat and said, pay up the $10 you owe me. That picture I have in my mind of catching somebody by the throat for some minor offense. I say, Lord, me release everybody. Me take my hands off. I, I tell you, a lot of people have got their hands on other people's throats. On their husband's throats, their wife's throats, and neighbor's throats, and all types of people. They've got something on them. Somebody in your boss's throats, or somebody who did harm to you somewhere, cheated you, something. Release them, my brother, sister, release them. You'll be a happier person. It doesn't matter if that guy cheated you or whatever it is. You'll be a happier person. I remember when I was a young Christian and I was greatly blessed by a particular verse in, I think it's in Second um, Second Chronicles 25. <clears throat> you know, it's a very interesting story here. If you don't know it, it's a good story to remember. Second Chronicles 25. It's about a king, Amaziah, who was... He came about as, as soon as he... He did what was right in the sight of the Lord. Second Chronicles 25, verse 1 and 2 but not with a whole heart, but he did what was right in the sight of the Lord. That means he was relatively better than the other kings. So the kingdom of Israel was divided into two kingdoms. This was southern called Judah, northern Israel, and then there was a... Uh, um, they had to go to battle against some other enemy. And when they went to, to battle against the enemy, it says in verse 6, he hired... 100,000 valiant warriors from the northern kingdom of Israel. Now, the northern kingdom of Israel were full of idolaters. The southern kingdom of Judah was better. There was not idolatry there. And a man of God came to him and said, O oh, king, now he had already hired these 100,000 men by paying them millions of dollars. Verse 7, a man of God said, Don't take those soldiers with you because the Lord is not with Israel. Because they're idol worshippers. And he said, and he said, if you take these idol worshipping hundred thousand soldiers with you, you will lose in the battle because God will not be with you. And this is the question. But Amaziah said, verse 9, But what shall I do when I've given these, paid him all of these hundreds of millions of dollars already? Then I'm not they're not going to give the money back to me. Here's the answer. The Lord can give you much more than this. That's a word the Lord spoke to me when I was a young Christian. Stand up for the Lord and for the principles of his word. You may lose something. You may lose financially, you may lose in your job, you may not get the promotion. The Lord is able to give you much more than this. I hope you will remember that word when you face a similar situation. The word of God, boy, how it has helped me in different situations in life. Read these stories, my brothers and sisters. Read them. There are little nuggets hidden here and there that can meet you in your time of need. When the devil tempts you about something, you can say to him, it is written, the Lord is able to give me much more than this. I've said that to the devil at different times, and then it doesn't bother me, that earthly loss. And the third stage in 1 John chapter 3 is to become fathers. So there's children, babies, young men, and then fathers. 1 John 2, I've written unto you fathers because you have known him who has been from the beginning. Again in verse 14, 1 John 2, 14, I've written unto you fathers because you have known him who has been from the beginning. That is the father in a much deeper way. Children know the Father in this way, how good He is to me, how the Father cares for me, provides for me, takes care of me, answers my prayer, lifts me up and looks at me with great delight. But we, when we grow up and become spiritual fathers, then we know the Father, the same Father, 
in a deeper way uh, that makes us treat other people like God treats us as a father. That means we become fathers to others to guide them, to lead them, to encourage them, to help them, to feed them, just like a, what does a father do at home? In other words, in the first stage of your Christian life, you're like the child at home, satisfied in the security of a father. Think of a child in your home, completely secure in his father's love. He's not worried, doesn't have a care in the world. Think of a two-year-old in a home. He doesn't care what's happening. Whether there was an earthquake or the house is on fire or it doesn't make a difference. Dad takes care of everything. That's the position of a child. When we grow up spiritually, we come to become young men, overcome the evil one, and then we come to the place of a father. And then you say, you become like the father in the home. How you care for the children and provide for them and deny yourself so that, uh, you know, your children supposing there's not enough food in the home. The father will deny himself. He'll go without that slice of bread so that his child can have a slice of bread. I mean, any good father does that. Where self-denial becomes a way of life. That's, that's to become a spiritual father and mother to other people. Where you serve them and you're willing to let them take advantage of you. You know, just like your children at home. And it's a sad thing when believers are not gradually growing up. They take more and more responsibility. I believe that in this church, there will be children. If it's a growing church, there'll be children, new people. First of all, our own children growing up. They are like spiritual babies. Newcomers who come, who've, been, who've grown up in churches, all they were fed with was milk. They never got anything more. And they can be believers 20 years and they come to this church and they're babies. That's all they were. They never heard anything more than your sins can be forgiven, your sins are forgiven, and you're on your way to heaven. And hopefully, they will grow up as they are here over a period of time to become like young men and women who have overcome Satan, who are not afraid of the devil, who are not physically struggling with the devil, they are resisting him in Jesus' name. That's the struggle we have. There's no struggle in that sense. We stand against Satan, and resist him in Jesus' name. He has no power over us. He's no, and then from there you grow up and also become like a spiritual father. And I'll tell you something. You don't have to be 60, 70 years old to become a spiritual father. You can be 25 years old and be a spiritual father. Sure. I've known of 25-year-old young men you know, in the world, I mean, where the father died and who take care of all their younger siblings even from the time they're 20 years old. Maybe the minds, it happens in India sometimes, the mother is a illiterate lady who can't work much and, uh, and the father's dead and so this 18, 20 year old boy goes to work and 18 years old and becomes like a father to his younger brothers and sisters. It's got a sense of responsibility. Dad's dead. Mom is not able to go to work. I'm 18 years old. I'm Hale and hardy, I don't have much ability, but I can go and earn a little bit of money to take care of my younger brothers and sisters. That's a father. He's only 18 years old. It's a sense of responsibility. And the great need in the church is for people to grow up like that. Caring for the younger ones, caring for the newcomers and the people who come who need to feel welcomed and encouraged and led on to godliness. People must be growing up here to be that type of person. So I want to encourage all of you, dear brothers and sisters, to grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. Don't, don't ever let that, don't let it stop. I always, I've used the example of an airplane in the sky. Here's an airplane of, uh, that's flying when will it drop? When can it drop? It drops when it shuts off its engine. Then it can't move forward. An airplane in the sky is either moving forward or it's dropping. It can't stand still. Christian life is like that. 
you are either moving forward or you're falling. You're not moving forward, whether you know it or not, you're falling, my brother, sister. Let's get those engines started again and before you crash on the ground, climb up and start moving forward again. Grow in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus. Seek to open your heart completely, just like pulling the blinds to let the sunlight in. Say, Spirit of God, come and fill me. Fill every part of my being. Make me holy. Fill my life and take possession of every area of my life. I yield to you. Don't live in doubt, keeping on doubt. Has the Holy Spirit come in or not, not come in, come in? The devil keeps people in doubt all the time. There's no need to be in doubt. Ask God for a definite assurance. That's how I went to God and said, Lord, I don't want to live in this perpetual uncertainty of am I filled with the Holy Spirit or not? I want to be filled with the Spirit every single day. Every day I want to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It's one of the prayers whenever my wife and I pray together in the morning. One of the prayers I keep praying, Lord, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Forgive me my sins and fill me with the Holy Spirit. Every day. Because I'm sure that even yesterday and every day of my life, there must have been some unconscious areas where I did not behave in a Christ-like way. I'm not aware of. It's conscious sin, of course, I can confess. There are unconscious areas. Until I become like Jesus, there will be areas where I'm not exactly had the right thought patterns that Jesus had. So I have to say every day, I have to say, Lord, forgive me my sins. Ones I'm not even aware of. Please cleanse me in the blood of Jesus. I'm passionate to become more like Jesus every day and every year. I want to be renewed completely. You can be a tremendous blessing in the world, my brothers and sisters, if you have this passion. That's the best way you can live on this earth. It doesn't matter if you don't make much money. Lord, I want to have a passion to be like Jesus more and more. I, I thought you know how you know, think of a man like Paul. What a tremendous blessing it would have been in those early days uh, when there was a problem in a church to have, oh, Paul is here. We can go to him. Or somebody's sick. We get Paul to come and pray for him. Just one man. And each of us can think, Lord, I want to be like that. I want to be like that so that it's a blessing that I'm in some place. Why can't it be like that with you, my brothers and sisters? No, never mind your past failure. You messed up your life. Okay, fine. God says, I don't know. I don't care for that. Don't keep on harking on that, harking on that. Don't let the devil remind you of all that messed up life. Finish with it. God says, I overlook. Acts 17, verse 30. Your days of ignorance I overlook. But repent now. Say, Lord, I want to grow in grace, knowledge of Jesus Christ. I want to be a good older brother to the younger ones in this church, a good older sister to the younger ones, not by imposing myself on them and trying to give them advice all the time. People will turn away from you if you're like that. But just being a gracious, radiant example of Christ-likeness. That should be our passion. Let's pray. <clears throat> it's good to respond to the Lord in your heart to whatever little thing the Lord whispered to you in your heart today in faith don't come to him with unbelief your father in heaven loves you far more than you think let me surprise you with that your Father in heaven loves you far more than you imagine. So you can come to him with boldness. He's your dad. He cares for you. Father, I pray that every single person here will really take heed to that exhortation to grow in grace. 
and the knowledge of Jesus from this day. And thus they will all be protected from the deceptions of unprincipled men. All the evil there is in society around us. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen.